Write this letter to the angel of the church in Thyatira. I know all the things you do. I've seen your love, your faith, your service, and your patient endurance. But I have this complaint against you. You're permitting that woman, that Jezebel who calls herself a prophet, to lead my servants astray. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. My wife and I have two teenage daughters, and one of the things that we loved doing as they were growing up was to introduce them to classic movies. Uh, I am from the generation um, that had some of the greatest movies in the 1980s. How many of you are with me there? Uh, And some of these great movies, we thought, we're going to introduce our kids to these classics. And I remember a few years ago, my wife and I, we took, uh, they had a remastered version of E.T., that was available in the theaters. So we took our kids to go see this. We were excited. We had talked up this movie forever, how great it was going to be. And the movie started. And within the first five minutes, my wife and I turned and looked at each other. We thought, what is this? I mean, there was so much swearing and sexual innuendo and the way they were talking to these adults. And I thought, this is a family movie. And I thought, I saw this when I was like eight. How do I not remember any of this stuff? Has this happened to any of your parents as you've kind of revisited some of your past from your childhood? The same thing happened when we went and saw Back to the Future or Ghostbusters, all these classic movies. I can't believe that this was in here. I don't remember any of this. And I say all this not to condemn these movies, but to say that I realized that what I was willing to tolerate as a kid when I wanted to see these is so different than what I'm willing to tolerate as a parent. In the late 1800s, G.K. Chesterton said this. He said, tolerance is the virtue of a man without convictions. Tolerance is the virtue of a man without convictions. Now, tolerance is a pretty volatile word today. We hear this word tossed back and forth, and, and it's usually with extremes, right? On one extreme, we're called for more tolerance to tolerate everything, to tolerate anyone. And on the other extreme, we'll say that tolerance is the downfall of our civilization. Maybe we hear statements like, if we'd only go back to the way things used to be. And more and more in our society, tolerance is not only seen as fashionable, but it's expected. It's been said the only thing that we won't tolerate is intolerance. Today, often being intolerant is seen as oppressive or abusive. But if we're to take Chesterton's quote at face value, it would seem that tolerance, no matter how much it's celebrated, demonstrates that we don't really have a truth. And I I put that in quotation marks like that, a truth, because the essence of intolerance today is to say that we have the truth, right? Right? There can't possibly be the truth. But does tolerance or intolerance lead us to a lack of character or convictions? There's an old saying that says, if you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything. And that's the very situation that we find the church we're going to look at today in Thyatira. We're in the fifth week of our series, The Seven Letters of Revelation. And today we come to the fourth letter right in the middle, to the church in Thyatira. That's a fun word, isn't it? Thyatira. They bet me back in the green and they're like, you're gonna mess that up. You can't say that 10 times over and over again. Thyatira. But just to recap, these seven letters were written by John while he was exiled on the island of Patmos. And he received a vision straight from Jesus Christ and wrote down these letters to these seven churches. They were messages from Jesus to his church. Now, there's so much rich imagery in these letters, some of which, frankly, if we're honest, is often confusing for us. But let's remember, these letters weren't written to us, but they are written for us. You've heard that phrase throughout this series. They're not written to us, but they're written for us. And it's, impossible, it's, it's important that we understand that because there's all sorts of nuance in allusions and illustrations, references to context and and principles and governments and things that were going on in the time that would have been readily apparent to the readers, the original hearers of this. But to us, we're a little confused. 
So we sometimes have to simply say, we don't know exactly everything that's going on here. We have to approach it with humility. There's some imagery that's apparent, and where that is, we'll talk about it, because it's usually very important. But there's other nuances in here that things that we just frankly don't understand. I heard a preacher that once said, we have to remember that uh, we're reading someone else's mail when we read this. While it wasn't written to us, it was written for us. And Pastor Ben shared with us last week why this is so important. Because it doesn't diminish its power that this wasn't written to us, does it? Because the word is alive and active. And so the reason that we're unpacking these seven letters to the church is because at its core, this is Jesus talking to the church. Jesus telling us what a Christ-centered, biblically-based, discipleship-driven church looks like. This is what he wants from us. So while it wasn't written to us, it is written for us. Well, this week, as I mentioned, we come to the church in Thyatira. Now, Thyatira was not an impressive city. It wasn't like a metropolis like Ephesus or some of these other cities that had a center of culture there. Thyatira is actually the smallest city that we're looking at here. We don't know very much about it. But while it was the smallest city, this is actually the longest letter. Jesus has the most to say to this small church in Thyatira. Now, we don't know a lot about Thyatira. The only biblical reference we have is found in the book of Acts. There's a woman named Lydia who was a seller of purple dye at one of the trades that this place was known for. And she was a Gentile who was wealthy. She opened her home to Paul and some of his companions. And Lydia was from Thyatira and is marked as the first convert to Christianity in Macedonia. This is the first person that was converted to Christianity. So she most likely brought back the message of Jesus, the gospel, to this town in Thyatira. Now, Thyatira's bread and butter was its trades. That's what it was known for. Think blue collar. Think, uh, think trades and goods and services. It was a great place to go shopping to get a lot of the things that were sold and built and manufactured and made and artisaned in Thyatira. In Thyatira, if it was known for one thing, it was known for its trade guilds. Now, understanding these trade guilds is important because the business of the town... The livelihood of the people that lived there was centered around these trade guilds. They had massive influence. Now, while trade guilds bear a little resemblance to what we might consider unions, they're actually much greater influence than that. Actually, our understanding of fraternities, a band of brothers, people who are doing life together like that, comes from trade guilds. And these trade guilds had massive influence. Each one of these trade guilds in the various trades that they represented each had their own god or goddess. In these guilds, as part of their ceremonies, as they would gather, they would, they would often participate in sexual morality or experience feasts where they would eat meat that was sacrificed to idols. Their influence was enormous. And so you need to remember these trade guilds because we're going to come back to them in a moment. But let's start with this letter to the church in Thyatira in Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 18. It says, write this letter to the angel of the church in Thyatira. If you remember, the angel is the pastor, the leader of this church. This is the message from the Son of God, whose eyes are like flames of fire and whose feet are like polished bronze. Now, we've seen in the previous letters, there's a pattern that's established here in each of these letters by Jesus. And he first starts off addressing these churches to let them know who he is. To give them the nature of Jesus. And as we unpack each of these seven churches, we learn a little bit more about who Jesus is from his description. And I believe that, once again, these letters were written to individual people here, that they would have read this maybe differently than we do. Because I believe that Jesus, in his description of himself, was telling something that these particular churches needed to hear, something they would hear in a unique way. For instance, this is the only letter where Jesus refers himself to himself as the Son of God. But that actually seems a little strange. That he, here he identifies himself as the Son of God, and I think there's a reason for that. Many of the people in Thyatira worshipped Apollo. Now, Apollo, if you're familiar with Greek mythology, was the son of the Greek god Zeus. 
And many scholars say that people often referred to Apollo as the son of God. They find inscriptions of that all throughout history, the history, and the coins and different things that we find in that era. So I think this imagery is important because Jesus wants to set the record straight. He wants these people to know, I'm the authority. I'm the son of God. I'm really who's in control. He says he has eyes of fire and feet like bronze. These are discerning eyes, convicting eyes, eyes that see the truth of a man's heart. So we're gonna see how that plays out later on in this reading. Now bronze, besides being one of the key trades of Thyatira and a metal that they were familiar with, bronzed feet is often a metaphor for power and the ability to crush out what needs to be destroyed. So following the pattern of the previous letters, Jesus goes on and he tells them, here's some great things about your church. He says, I know all the things you do. Remember, this is the son of God with eyes that can see. So I know everything you do. I have seen your love, your faith, your service, and your patient endurance. And I can see your constant improvement in all these things. Love, faith, service, endurance. This is what every church is aspiring to. I would love for Jesus to write to our church and say, this is what I think about you guys. And besides just these great things, he says, you're growing. You're growing in your understanding of these things. There's improvement happening. And I think that like the church in Thyatira, this has some resemblance to us. I mean, we're a church that's known for our love. We value people. We value relationships and reaching out to others. Now, unlike the church in Ephesus, the first church we looked at, this church in Thyatira, they have loving others and God down well. The church in Ephesus had doctrine and intellect down, but they struggled with how they loved. Thyatira, though, was loving well. They were growing in their acts of service. But... And we know that's always coming, right? There's a but here. He says in verse 20, but I have this complaint against you. You're permitting that woman, that Jezebel who calls herself a prophet to lead my servants astray. She teaches them to commit sexual sin and to eat food offered to idols. So what did this church become tolerant of? So he says, when you are permitting this woman, another translation for that is tolerating. What have, you been, what have they become tolerant of? The teachings and the influence of Jezebel in the church. Now, just last week, we celebrated child dedication. And if you were here, you saw all these cute baby pictures and there's some amazing names and not one of them was named Jezebel. It's just not a name that we use a lot. It's similar to how we don't see a lot of guys named Judas. It doesn't carry a great connotation to it, does it? And even in our modern day, you don't hear many people referring to someone as a Jezebel as a positive thing. It's often actually today used as a racial slur or a word to, to uh, degrade women. It's not a nice name to call or to be called. So I wanna suggest to you as we look at this that we be very careful how we throw that name around. Now, if you're not familiar with Jezebel, Queen Jezebel was the daughter of the king of Sidon, which was not one of God's nations. And he mar she married the king Ahab, who was the king of Israel, God's chosen nation. And Jezebel, through her power and influence and her scheming, led her husband Ahab away from God, and introduced other gods to worship. She did a whole bunch of other things. She uh, had God's prophets harassed and murdered and arranged for an innocent man to be accused and then murdered. She was not a good person. So if you're not familiar with who Jezebel is, I encourage you can he read her story in 1 Kings. But she was full of pride and thirsty for power. She was full of pride and thirsty for power. Now, was there a woman named Jezebel living and leading the church in Thyatira? Most likely not. Even back then, that wasn't a name that was used very often. Here we see what's most likely an illustration for us to understand that there's someone that's acting like Jezebel within this church. Someone who's influential, eloquent, 
was somehow had led this church away from God, within the church, but leading thing, them away from God. Now, whether this woman was actually involved in sexual morality within those within the church, whether she's sleeping with people in the church or not, or whether this is used as an illustration for idolatry of the sin that this false teacher was propagating, either way, the lesson is the same. And, and once again, I believe that the people of Thyatira would have known exactly who and what Jesus is referring to here. Remember, we're reading someone else's mail. But the takeaway is the same. This Jezebel, this leader, this influencer within the church was guilty of leading people away from God. And the church, its problem was it was tolerating her. She had somehow convinced some within the church that sin was okay under certain circumstances for certain reasons. Now, how in the world could the church fall into a trap of believing sexual morality and eating meat sacrificed to idols was okay? Well, remember the trade guilds that we talked about earlier. These were the centers of social life and commerce. And their representative gods, part of the ceremonies to them would involve sexual morality, would involve eating meat sacrificed to idols. We heard a little bit about that last week. And it was central, life in Thyatira was centered around these trade guilds. So to not be part and to participate within these trade guilds would practically cut you off from society. It really was the center of life. It would cut you off from being influential, cut you off from friends and social gatherings and parties, and most notably, it would cut off your source of income. There was so much commerce involved in this. Barclay, in his commentary, says that to not participate in aspects of the trade guild was the equivalent of commercial suicide. If you wanted to make a living, you were part of the trade guilds and all that went along with it. And apparently this Jezebel had convinced some that it was okay to participate in immorality. That the ends justified the means. Thyatira teaches us, here's the first lesson we get from Thyatira. Thyatira teaches us that we can't mix the truth of God with the ways of the world. We can't mix the truths of God with the ways of the world. And this growing acceptance from within the church now, from within the church, it was eroding the foundations of their faith from the inside out. And other places in scripture tells us we shouldn't be surprised of this. 2 Timothy 4.3 tells us, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wandering off into myths. Church, let me be clear. Let me be clear. We don't force the ways of God on others. We're often accused of being intolerant, but we don't force the ways of God on others. I actually heard it said this way, that as believers, we shouldn't impose our beliefs on others, but we should propose the things of God. We shouldn't impose our beliefs on others, but propose the things of God. Now, intolerance is a word. Intolerance isn't always bad. It's hard for us to see that sometimes. While the world may blanketly oppose intolerance, there are plenty of examples where intolerance is not only tolerated, but required. We think about it this way. How many of us would be okay with our kids being driven to school on a bus, driven by a bus driver that had DUIs? We wouldn't be okay with that. Or sending our kids to school if our kindergarten teacher didn't know how to read and write. That's an, we wouldn't accept that. See, if we as a church were known for intolerance, most of us wouldn't be here. Tolerance at its core is part of the DNA of this church. Christ the Rock is known in this community as an accepting place, a church that opens its doors to many, often that other churches don't know what to do with or have a hard time accepting. We're a church of broken people. I'm broken. You're broken. We don't hide that. It's part of our DNA. We say that all people, no matter their story, and that isn't just a quippy saying, we actually mean it. 
that those who felt outcast and condemned, excluded in life, even from the church, often find a home here at Christ the Rock. And that's a beautiful thing, amen? It's what I'm gonna call for us a holy tolerance. A type of tolerance and openness to enter into the messes that we each find ourselves in. Whether from our own mistakes or the mistakes of others. It's a holy tolerance, a tolerance that recognizes that we're all affected by sin. It's a tolerance and openness to people that are far from God. And Thyatira excelled in that. But there was another kind of tolerance that had crept in. It had become a cancer inside this church. It wasn't tolerance of the world. It was tolerance of the sin of the world within the church. Thyatira's problem was misplaced tolerance. Thyatira's problem was misplaced tolerance. Now, we might not lose our jobs like those folks in Thyatira might have. We're not part of trade guilds, and most of us aren't part of clubs that are encouraging us to engage in sexual immorality or to worship idols. But we face some of the same temptations to follow Jezebel into bed. The same avenues of compromise are available for us today. Because we're not just encouraged, but we're expected to be tolerant. And it's often a misplaced tolerance. And not just tolerant of the world. Sometimes this comes from within. That we say the ends justify the means. We're willing to compromise on things. Because after all, look at the good that might come from it. You might have heard about a popular podcast called The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. It's taken over. Uh, it's really, really popular right now. And it's the story of a church, Mars Hill Church, that was led by Pastor Mark Driscoll. And Mark was a charismatic leader, a great teacher. But who, he led this church that had a meteoric rise. It had grown, and so many great things happened in this church. Story after story of lives being changed, of people coming to know who Jesus was. But Mark led with some misplaced tolerances. Some things that he justified. And this church, the leadership of this church, the core of this church began to also justify this. Began to tolerate things that were not of God. The way they would treat others, decisions that were made. And he influenced others to follow suit because the ends, after all, justified the means. Church, we have to be careful who we allow to influence us. Even so-called Christian influences uh, from pastors. Yes, even pastors who stand up here on the platform that teach us in our classes we have to be careful who influences us, how, what we allow to influence us from television preachers or YouTube, YouTubers or bloggers, authors. Just because it's in the Christian section doesn't make it from God. My wife actually said it this way. She said, not everyone speaking biblical truth or biblical words is speaking biblical truth. Not everyone speaking biblical words is speaking biblical truth. The ends don't justify the means. And here's the problem with misplaced tolerance. Misplaced tolerance makes us comfortable with compromise. Misplaced to tolerance makes us comfortable with compromise. See, like the church in Thyatira, we have to be on guard of Jezebel. There's a recent Pew research that was done, and this is alarming but I'm gonna to get to why it's really alarming in a second. And it found that 57% of Christians believe that sex outside of marriage, if you're in a committed relationship, is okay. 57%, over half. Now, 50% of Christians believe that casual sex is okay. 20% of Christians believe that sex on the first date is okay. Now, these statistics might seem alarming, but here's where it really gets a little out there. Each year, these numbers are growing. We're growing in our tolerance. Even in the church, 
We're growing tolerant. And it's not just sex, is it? I mean, we have consumerism, our casual attitude towards divorce, media that we watch, the language that we use, even with those of us within the church. We're growing in our tolerance. And we're going in the wrong direction. This is a misplaced tolerance. There's a quote that says, whatever we tolerate in moderation, our children will indulge in to excess. Jesus keeps talking here. What does he have to say? Starting in verse 20. He says, I gave her time to repent, but she does not want to turn away from her immorality. Talking about Jezebel. Therefore, I will throw her onto a bed of suffering and those who commit adultery with her will suffer greatly unless they repent and turn away from her deeds. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am the one who searches out the thoughts and intentions of every person. And I will give to each of you whatever you deserve. But I also have a message for the rest of you in Thyatira who have not followed this false teaching, deeper truths as they call them, depths of Satan actually. I will ask nothing more of you except that you hold tightly to what you have until I come. See, it's so easy to compromise. But misplaced tolerance doesn't make us more relatable. We haven't unlocked some deeper truths. We have to be careful of anyone who might say, if you just would learn this, or your church might not teach this, but if you just understand this about yourself or this about the scripture, then you're somehow enlightened to something greater adding or taking away from the word of God. That's almost always driven, like Jezebel, by pride, by thinking that we know better, or often a thirst for power to put us in control of others. But we don't wear our sin as a badge of honor. And I know that that seems kind of ridiculous to say, but I've done this. And you might have done it too thinking that somehow that makes us more relatable, more real to the people around us. See, we're not more enlightened as a follower of Jesus if we have a rougher story or we're rough around the edges or we're just keeping it real. Because sin is not something to be proud of. Jesus is intolerant of sin. He makes this clear here. He makes this clear. Jesus is intolerant of sin, but he's indiscriminate in love. Jesus is intolerant of sin, but indiscriminate in love. We see this in verse 21. He says, I've given her time to repent. I want Jezebel to be made right with me. And he gives us time to repent as well. See, instead of misplaced tolerance, we need to have a holy tolerance. That holy tolerance, that openness, helps us to win people to Christ because we see that all of us been separated from God. But as we grow in disciples, and as disciples, we move from one thing to another. We become not what we once were, but something new. Max Lucado has a quote in a book where he says, God accepts each and every one of us just as we are. But he doesn't want us to stay that way. And that's who we want to be as a church. We want to call each other to understand that we accept, we love just like God loves, has loved us. But we don't want you to stay that way. I'm going to put a verse up here on the screen from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You've probably seen this before. It's this long list of, of things that we once were, sins that propagate our lives. And you might look at that and see yourself in some of those. But you see that part that's highlighted. Some of you once were this. You're not anymore. You once were, but now you are. See, we're to be a people who have sound doctrine like Ephesus, but we lead with love. We should be socially conscious, but morally strong. See, these things aren't mutually exclusive. We're called to indiscriminate love. Like the church in Thyatira, we're to be known for our love, unconditional. But unconditional love 
isn't the same as undiscerning acceptance. Let me say that again. Unconditional love isn't the same as undiscerning acceptance. Our tolerance, our holy tolerance is invitational. It recognizes that all of us, both inside the church and those who don't have a relationship with Jesus, are broken people. We all have stories. but We all have a need for a savior. So we can be in the world, but not of the world. But we need discernment, not blanket acceptance. Unconditional love isn't the same as undiscerning acceptance. So who am I allowing to influence me? What am I allowing to influence me? Where are those areas in my life where I'm being influenced in ways that maybe are not of God? Is there a behavior or a thought or even a teaching that I'm tolerating? Now, each letter ends with a promise. And these promises are where we see the love of Jesus on full display, his unconditional love. He says this in verse 26, to all who are victorious, who obey me to the very end. And then he quotes from Psalm 2. He says, to them I will give authority over all the nations. They will rule the nations with an iron rod and smash them like clay pots. What's amazing about this word, what's interesting about this word rule, the direct translation of that isn't like lord it over, some kind of dominion over people. It's actually shepherd. Will shepherd the nations with an iron rod. He says, they will have the same authority that I received from my father and I will also give them the morning star. Our understanding of that is that's Jesus. Who give them Jesus. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Now again, in humility, we have to admit, I have to admit, I don't totally know what all this means. But it's clear that Jesus promises that those who hold to his teaching, those who don't fall into the trap of deep things, will experience a victory. We sang about that this morning. The victory that we have in Jesus Christ. Not because of what we've done, but because of who he is. And the promise that Jesus gives us here is meant to serve as a reminder that in the end, no matter what we might have to face in this world, that God's people would receive the reward. It also served as motivation for those who had fallen astray. It wasn't too late. If they would repent of following Jezebel, even if it cost them in this world, their jobs, their livelihoods, their influence, their friends, their social life, that they would receive a reward in the things to come. Even though it might not look like it in the moment, the here and now. And even though it might cost us in 2021, it might cost us influence. It might cost us friends. It might cost us our job, social standing, power. So we would understand that Jesus, the conquering Jesus, will rule and reign. The Jesus with the fiery eyes who sees the truth sees into our heart. And that rule, that shepherding, would extend to us and for us. See, the goal of us in holy tolerance, even if the world may call it intolerance, the goal, the promise isn't that we'll dominate, it's that we'll shepherd in love. So how do we demonstrate unconditional love and discernment? Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. No matter where we started from, no matter how conformed to the world we once were, we can be transformed. As we grow more and more like Christ, the Holy Spirit renews our mind and shows us the perfect will of God. We must be on guard for Jezebels among us. Who or what are you allowing to influence you? Where are you allowing other influences to creep into your life? They're bringing you away from Jesus. What are the Jezebels in your own heart, in your own mind? 
What or who are you allowing to influence you? Is there a behavior or a thought or a teaching that you're tolerating, that you've bought into in order to try to fit in, in order to try to understand the deeper truths of God, whatever the reason might be? Where is your tolerance changed? Something that you once never would have accepted is now, it's okay. Because the ends justify the means. Where are you trying to fit in? Do you have a misplaced tolerance? Here's what I think is amazing about these questions. These are questions to invite us into what God wants for each and every one of us. He wants us to be aware of the Jezebels in and among us, even within our own hearts. He wants us to quit tolerating those things. Because I believe that there is nothing more powerful in this, this time right now than a church that is sound in teaching and leads with love. If we can be tolerant of the right things, invitational tolerance, a holy tolerance, but not tolerate sin among us. I believe the world is looking for that truth. Is our desire to be accepted, to fit in, to enjoy life, is it clouding our judgment? Where are you crawling into bed with Jezebel? Where are we as a church? Who or what are we allowing to influence us? And are there behaviors, thoughts, and teachings that we're just tolerating? Well, if so, it's not too late. Jesus, indiscriminate in that love, just like he was for Thyatira, offers us the same option to repent, to turn, to be changed. I want to leave you with a prayer. This is a prayer from the Apostle Paul that was written to the church in Philippi. Now, this church was facing some of the same struggles Thyatira was and some of the same things that we are, trying to be a light in a dark place. It's a prayer for us today from Philippians chapter one, verse nine. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. That's discernment. So that you would be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, all to the glory and praise of God. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for this letter to Thyatira. We thank you for the love that you had for them, that you wanted them to turn, that you wanted them to be aware of what they were tolerating among them. Lord, we thank you for offering that grace to us as well to turn away from Jezebel. God, may you reveal to each and every one of us, even in this moment right now, the things we're allowing to influence us, the people, the thoughts that we're allowing to influence us. God, what are we tolerating? Bring it to our hearts, bring it to our minds. Convict us, Holy Spirit, of that so that we could turn, that we could be changed so that we, even as a church, Lord, could be known for being full of truth and leading in love. May we be that to the world around us so they could see what you truly intended for the church. God, open our hearts to hear from you those ways that we're allowing ourselves to be influenced. May we repent and turn from them. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And the church together said... Amen.